Thank you so much. We are going to hear more from you, but now the funeral services for Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz are starting, and we're going to take you there. On behalf of the Mazurkowitz family and the Rochester Police Department, thank you for coming to pay your final respects to Officer Anthony Maz Mazurkowitz, my friend. Tony is my friend. And the greatest gift you can give to someone is your time. Because when you give your time, you're giving them a portion of life that you never get back. Tony gave me his time. He is one of the kindest, genuine, funniest, and intelligent men I've ever known. And he was a man of faith. He and I talked a lot. Sergeant uh, Potok recently said to me, you and Tony had some pretty interesting conversations. Yes, we did. Very interesting conversations. And it was always regarding our faith. He wanted to know good versus evil, angels versus demons, exorcism versus deliverance, God's love and grace. We talked, and he asked for some books to read, which I gave him. He was always respectful of my views. He had a way of making me look deeper into my faith. He had a way of questioning the things I said to make me look deeper into what I believed and why I believed it. I miss my friend. My, my heart is broken. My grief is deep, but because of his friendship, I am a better priest today, a better man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we remember Tony, who has made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. We read the words of sacred scripture, there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for a friend. By your grace and the love you have for him, he is at rest now, under the shelter of your grace and presence. We remember his family and ask for your precious blessings to fill their home with your love peace and strength to fill their lives each and every day. And may our officers here present and those on duty be supplied with the courage to face each day as Tony did. And may they trust in your almighty power to accomplish each task they face today and tomorrow. Amen. Here. I'm Brooks, Tony's oldest daughter. Last week, this community lost a hero and a police officer. My mom lost a husband. My siblings and I lost our father, and my three little girls lost a papa. But you guys all know that part from the news and from social media, so I'm up here to tell you the parts that you might not know. 
Last week, my mom lost the love of her life, her invincible husband, who she was looking forward to growing old with. My brother Brad lost his best friend and his first phone call for all things good and bad. My brother Brent lost his idol. My baby sister Bryce, a daddy's girl, lost the best man she will ever know. My husband Sean lost his best friend and the man he most looked up to in the entire world. I myself, I lost so much. Many times throughout this last week, it has felt like I lost it all. I lost my fixer, my rock, my safest space to land. But truly the worst part of this for me is that my three little girls lost their grilled cheese making, nap partner, swing pushing, tree climbing, Tuesday Papa Care provider, nickname calling Papa. Tony was a police officer through and through. He was tough, rule following, stoic, and there was really truly little that rattled him. He was the absolute, hard, absolute hardest worker, not just at work, but also at home. He was devoted to the RPD, the union, and especially his tactical unit brothers and sisters. As you'll hear today, he did many amazing things in his 29 years with the RPD. And as a family, we were very eagerly awaiting getting to watch him enjoy a well-deserved retirement. But I want to tell you all about the other side of Tony, the family man. In our eyes, there was truly nothing Tony couldn't do. He was invincible. He raised the four of us to become independent, educated, successful, hardworking people. Throughout our childhood, he gave us his all. Unlike many parents, he didn't have hobbies when we were young, like golfing or men's league sports. He truly devoted all his time to us and our extracurriculars. As we all grew, got our own relationships, families, and homes, we still remain that special family union and could often be found back at our family home for dinner, a visit, a bag of cheese as we headed home to make our own family dinner because we didn't want to stop at the grocery store, truly anything. Tony was never happier than when we were all at home. He was cooking some elaborate dish with my brother Brad, and the house was full of banter and my little girl's giggles. He was not the type to be mushy or gushy with his emotions, but we never ever questioned his love for us because he showed it in all the things he did for us every single day, always, far, far into our adulthood. When my husband Sean and I brought home our first daughter Kinsley, we soon learned that while Tony was a great dad, he was an even better papa. Tony has always helped us at least one to two times a week watch our girls while we worked, despite working overtime, crazy alternative hours, and having his own household to run, he rarely missed a three-girl Tuesday. He was always our go-to and would drop everything to help us watch a girl, stop by and drop something off when I couldn't bear to drag three little girls through the store, or just come over and check something for me. All three of our daughters adored him. The part that hurts the most for me is that my girls no longer have Papa Tuesdays, they won't have him on the sidelines at their events or have him to cater to their whining to make buttered noodles when his annual prime rib Christmas dinner was not to their liking. I know he would have made them better people by being in their lives longer because he certainly made all the rest of us better. Tony, we will ensure that Beans, Emmy Lou, and Juanita, your nicknames for my kids, always remember you and that they become tax-paying, law-abiding citizens, just like you would have wanted. Tony, here's my promise to you. We will always stay together, and we will stay strong as this original family unit, plus our added additions. We will take care of mom always, but no promises on curbing her target spending. We will make good dinners and get together often. We will tell funny stories and share your memory with Kinsley, Emmy, and Noah, and all the future grandchildren you will unfairly never meet. We will light bonfires and sit in a lawn chair and look at the stars, and we will do it often. We will clean as we cook and pick up after ourselves. We'll never lose sight of how important this family is, and we'll always care for each other just like you did. We will set off fireworks as loud as possible with no regard for the neighbors. 
We will enjoy beverages occasionally, and we will celebrate all life's events just as you would have. But now, even more, because what you taught us recently is that just one moment can change everything. Finally, and I know you're not gonna like this part, but we're gonna do all these things with only half a heart. The peace we lost on July 21st is so large, our hearts could never possibly be whole again. Tony, thank you for making me a better me. Thank you for teaching me the most important parts of life and how to weed through the rest. Thank you for setting my standards for all people, particular, particularly men, so darn high. I will love you every single day and miss you for the rest of my life. Please watch over us. We need you now more than ever. Love your adoring and forever grateful daughter. I'm Brad, uh, Tony's oldest son. Uh, Tony came into my life in 1993 when I was around four years old. And during that time, that's when a tie, or kid dabbles in sports to see what they, uh, they like and see what sticks. My first choice was football, but I was far too scrawny to be allowed to play it by my mother. Um, they allowed me to play hockey, so I would be covered from head to toe in pads. Uh, Tony got me my first hockey stick, one of those wooden handle sticks with the, uh, the plastic blade, and he got himself a matching adult version of it. We'd be uh, playing in the driveway all the time, and uh, <laughs> he finally, when I got a little older, put me in the goal with the cheapest goalie pads you can buy <laughs> that provided no protection. And uh, one day he promptly shot a uh, plastic hockey puck into my crotch. <laughs> hard, hard enough to uh, leave a pretty healthy bruise there. But I think it was an attempt to toughen me up, but as we all know, I think Tony thought it was absolutely hysterical. Um, my form of revenge for that was to be a little difficult during high school. I uh, tried to hide things in my car, tried to pretend like I didn't have a few beverages when I did, but he found pretty much every damn thing I ever tried to hide. And that resulted in me being grounded for about 50% of my high school career. Fast forward to when, in his terms, I got my shit together. <laughs> so Dennis told me the other day. Um, our relationship morphed into more of a friendship. And Tony was the very first person I would call if something good happened, something bad happened. If I wanted to brag about something, I could count on him for a quick congratulations, often in an indirect Tonyism, and then uh, move on to what's next or what I could have done better. And all those grounding talk, groundings, talking tos, focusing on what's next has morphed me into the man I am today, and I'll always appreciate that from him. Next, I'd like to share a little excerpt that he texted me a few weeks ago to show really how selfish, selfless he was. The text reads, here's a fun story. Got into it, mom, over the new car. Sticker was in the wrong place. Tailgate goes up too high. Rear foot sensor for the tailgate doesn't work all the time. AC not cold enough. I refused to take it in. She did, got a loaner. Came home, announced that everything was fixed and better. I read the receipt. Every single item was checked by two texts and found to be working properly. I did not say a word. Unreal. <laughs> He could have basked in the glory of being right, but as we all know, he, he didn't take that opportunity. I'll always say if something was a little off in his head for marrying my mom when we, she had two young kids, but I'm eternally grateful that he did. He was the best father, friend, and man that I could have ever asked for. I'd like to finish this with a challenge to the city, our elected officials, to allow Tony's death and all the grieving in this room to be the catalyst to make changes and apply the necessary resources to ensure that this doesn't happen again and to make for damn sure something good comes from this. Hello, my name is Brent. I'm the second son of Tony. And thank you all for being here today. 
There are not enough words I could find to describe how remarkable my father truly was. He always was so dedicated to his work and his family. Throughout this process, I've begun to reminisce on all the good times with my father. Whether it was our 17-hour road trips down to Memphis, or it was sitting in the backyard enjoying bonfires with the family. Going fishing in Horseshoe Lake, Arkansas was my dad's favorite vacation. Sitting at the end of D-Day's dock was the most relaxed and happy version of my dad. So I picture him in his paradise at this very moment, enjoying himself. Sitting, joking, laughing, and hanging around the bonfire was a perfect release from reality. The conversations we had ranged from what was going on in our lives to what was out there in space. The possible topics with us were endless. Some of my first memories were with my dad. I remember being with my dad at a place filled with tractors. I played on the tractors for hours, and my dad said we could come here all the time. We never went back. Uh, but I do not hold any grudge against him. I remember my dad was always excited when he had a fish on the line down in Horseshoe Lake. My father was a model of excellence to me. He represented what it was to be a great person and a great man. I'll forever have him in my heart and make sure that each day I will make him proud. We all love you, Dad, and we will see you again one day. Hi, I am the youngest daughter, Bryce. My dad took me to every softball tournament practically every weekend of every summer for nearly a decade, maybe even more. We would never let my mom join because we had our routine and that's how we liked it. The one time she finally got to join, it was our longest one yet and it was an 11 hour drive. We barely made it out of our neighborhood, literally 30 seconds down the road before my dad and I were threatening to turn the car back around and drop her back off at home. He would complain about the early mornings and the late nights and the excessive heat, but I think he sec secretly loved every second of it. If you know him, you know food was his love language, and he made one rule from when we traveled. We were watching diners, dives, and drive-ins like we did almost every night. We'd stay up until three in the morning watching it. His rule was that we couldn't eat at a chain restaurant or any restaurant that we'd be able to eat at in Rochester. He would make note of all the featured restaurants on the show, and he would research before we left for tournaments for the best food spots. I loved our tradition more than anything and had some really good food. When I began working at Strong, he would ensure that dinner was ready when I came home from a 12-hour shift. And when we both worked overnights, he would stop and get us breakfast so we could eat together before going to bed. He was and still is So proud that I work at Strong and almost done with my nursing degree. I graduate next May. He was so excited for me to finish school and start working my big girl job so he wouldn't have to worry about my student loans during his retirement next year. <laughs> he loved when he had a house full of people and mouths to feed. We always joked that we made up our own occasions and our own celebrations so we ha could have family time together. Family dinner and bonfire, like clock clockwork, that was our thing. If he wasn't working at night, he was out by the fire having a rum and coke, diet coke. Almost every night since he's been gone, we've had a fire for him and we've all had rum and cokes. It will never be the same, but I know that he would want us to do the things that he loved and that we loved for him. I'll forever miss his homemade meals and sitting by the fire well into the morning. My dad has been called a hero by many since being killed on the 21st. But he's always been a hero to my mom, to my siblings, and myself. He's always gone above and beyond for not only us and our family, but for all of you in Rochester. He was always the wittiest one in the room, and you couldn't escape without getting a nickname, and his laugh was extremely contagious. There isn't a clear-cut way to describe my dad. It was just an honor and a privilege to even know him and to be raised by him. The stories and the lessons and the memories I've gained from being blessed with him as a father go far beyond what I can share with you today. I've never imagined a world where he doesn't get to see me graduate college, start my dream job at Strong, or walk me down the aisle.
I really can't fathom that this is our reality. He deserved more time, and we all deserve more time with him. He was and forever will be the best dad, husband, and papa. Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our family today. I'm Alan Gates. Tony was my brother-in-law and my friend. Our family has been overwhelmed with the support and generosity of the community, community and really the nation. Last night, seeing the streets lined with so many people was simply beautiful. And we saw the hurt and the pain on your faces. So thank you for loving and caring for us. Thank you for all who've made this day happen. There's a lot of work that goes into this event today, and thank you for making it happen. I'd also like to thank Bishop Salvatore and some fellow priests who celebrated a Mass for our family this week. When our loved ones were ripped away from our lives in such a tragic, sudden, and shocking death, we'll often ask questions. We might be angry with God, and that's okay. But I plead with you not to turn away from God in anger. These are the times when we should be turning to God, really leaning into God for his comfort and peace. Do not let evil invade your heart. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Lord tells us, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. When we feel weak and we're not sure we can carry on, Let's cling to this promise and receive his grace and power. We're often asked, how is the family doing? Lynn, Tony is so proud of you. There have been a full range of emotions this week, sadness, grief, confusion, anger, but the past week has also been filled with more laughter than I would have expected. Yes, we know we're using humor to mask the pain and push the dark days away. But with humor and with the love of family and friends and with God's graces, we will persevere just as Tony would want. So many of you may just know Tony as a police officer. I'd also like to share some other stories of how his family knows Tony. Of course, before he was a policeman, he was first a son and a brother. His family calls him Anthony. His parents, Rose and Frank, are here mourning with us today. Anthony was their second child, the first son to be born. With his older sister, Lisa, and the younger brother, Frank, the Mazurkowitz had a loving and with Tony involved, no doubt, a lively home. Anthony loved sports and he loved to be outside. Anthony and Frankie spent countless hours together, playing outside, playing hide and seek in the cornfield near their home, throwing the football, and playing baseball down at the park. In fact, it was down at the park where young Anthony probably began to protect and serve. One day there was another boy roughing up young Frankie. Tony comes flying in, throws the boy off Frankie, and helps his brother up. Now, Anthony, to be fair, he did not always protect Frankie, but he just was not going to allow anyone besides himself to pick on or beat on little Frankie. Some of Tony's traits that we all know so well began in his youth, giving nicknames that stuck and causing a little mischief. His family says he had endless creativity when giving nicknames or poking fun at someone. It was usually not simple humor, and it was never really intended to insult. His family has two stories to share regarding Anthony's mischievous ways. When they were younger, 
Anthony and Frankie would spend several weeks during the summer at their grandparents' home in Amsterdam. After I visited with the family this week and heard more stories, I believe these trips were really just an opportunity to give Rose and Frank a little break from the boys. One trip, Anthony somehow managed to sneak fireworks into his luggage. That summer, it was a very dry summer, perhaps similar to this year, the boys began to play with the fireworks and managed to catch the grass on fire. The fire got close enough to the house to cause the grandmother to dump a basket of wet clothes onto some flames. Now, of course, young Anthony, he tried to act like he did not know whose fireworks they were or how they even got there. Suffice to say, the grandparents were not pleased with these actions, but this may have begun Tony's love of burning stuff and spending time around the fire pit. The second story involves an infamous family photo. Unfortunately, it was not in the slideshow this morning, but there was a large family gathering for Easter, a somewhat rare event for the Mazurkowitz family. It had all the aunts, uncles, and the cousins all together. Young Anthony, judging from the picture, maybe around 10 years old, thought it'd be a great idea to hold up two, two Easter eggs, as the 10-year-old Anthony would say, boobs. And you know what? It was a great idea, because it is now referred to as the picture Anthony ruined. However, it is a picture that is treasured, more talked about, and better remembered than most photographs. Anthony was a loyal son and a loyal brother. He would become a loyal friend to many, and you knew that once he was in your corner, that he would always be there, standing ready to protect and serve. Of course, Tony became a policeman. You'll hear from several others about Maz, the policeman. Tony somewhat compartmentalized his work life and his family life, I think, at least pertaining to job information to his extended family. I do understand, however, that Tony would certainly share his family life with the TAC unit, especially some calls with Lynn. We never really knew his job details or that he was such a leader in the TAC unit. My daughter once asked Tony what type of police officer he was, and he said, not an important one, nothing special. They were on a six-hour car ride, so they had time to chat a little bit more, and my daughter loves to chat. She finally declared that he was like a guardian angel, watching over people. And now he is truly an angel in blue, watching over all of us. It has been said happiness is, what you, is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. I know Tony was happy, because his thoughts, his words, and his actions were in harmony. He would share his thoughts and let you know his point of view of how he saw things. He would hold people accountable, set a high standard for them. He would do this especially for his fellow TAC officers and for his family, and I think he really viewed them as the same. I'm proud to count two of those members, Dennis and Paul, as members of my family, and I thank you for all that you've done for Lynn and her family and stood with them this week. It was an honor and privilege to spend time with the TAC unit this week. Thank you. Tony served on the union board for 20 years. His voice for the police family is now lost. I hope as contract negotiations head to arbitration that the Rochester police men and women can finally have a contract that they can continue to serve Rochester with pride. Three years, especially the last three years, is just too long without a contract. After Tony became a policeman, he would become a husband, a father, and a grandfather. I now want to share how Tony came into my life and my nickname for Tony. I would refer to Tony as St. Anthony. Because St. Anthony was a savior to my sister and her family. I did not really get to spend much time with Tony before they got married, but I knew, I knew when I walked my sister down the aisle that Tony would take care of my sister and her family. It was just another example of his mindset, his character, his willingness to protect and serve, traits that would make him one of my heroes. Lynn and Tony, of course, as you saw, have a total of four grandchildren 
and were taking great delight in their three grandchildren. The girls loved Papa, and he certainly loved them. Tony was the family's protector, and he served them in so many ways. They built such a beautiful family and a beautiful life, and he was the glue that held that family together. My family was blessed with a visit to Rochester just three weeks ago. There was a picture in the slideshow. We had not seen them in a long time due to, of course, the 2020 pandemic and other challenging schedules, but it was a weekend filled with the simple pleasures that Tony enjoyed, good food, time outdoors, and of course, bonfires, because he liked to burn stuff. Ernie Johnson, the sportscaster, has a beautiful book called Unscripted. And in that book, he describes Blackberry moments. These are basically those types of moments that impact you and are seared into your heart and into your soul. Those happy moments that when you think about them make you feel warm and good. I knew upon our, our departure that we had a Blackberry moment. And as I sent a text to the entire family, I thanked Lynn and Tony for allowing the use of their home and stated that it was indeed a special time. Of course, I had no idea what a large Blackberry moment that would turn into. I'm eternally grateful for that long weekend, and I now consider that truly a God moment that we were able to have that time together. That was a grace that God gave us because he knew his schedule and we don't. So I'll leave you with two things. First, treasure and savor the Blackberry moments of your life. And second, know that we will see Tony again. And in the meantime, St. Anthony is still with us, loving us, protecting us, and serving us as he in the presence of God himself. Peace to you, and God bless you. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Peets, and Tony was my friend. As I sat down at home with my phone and started to take notes about what I wanted to say, I thought about the magnitude of the amount of people that were going to be here today, and I started getting a little anxiety. Then I remembered the freshman public speaking class I took 31 years ago, and I thought to myself, I really should have paid attention. <laughs> but then I had a voice in the back of my head that reminded me of two things, good eye contact and everyone's naked. Thank you, Tony. My wife Jennifer and I first met Tony and Lynn 18 years ago during a neighborhood block party. We had just moved to Fairport and hadn't really met too many of our new neighbors. We felt an immediate comfort with both of them. For me, Tony reminded me so much of my own three brothers. His quick wit and effortless ball busting was top notch. I knew then that he was someone special. Early on in our relationship, I quickly learned what Tony was all about. He was a devoted family man who was always there for Lynn and the kids. He was a dedicated police officer, and he was someone that was always there for his friends. He was a true man of his word. When he told you he was gonna do something, he did it. He was always there to offer a hand when you needed one, and he would rarely ever ask for help in return. He simply didn't want to burden you. That was the kind of guy that he was. With Tony, you always knew where he stood on the topic of discussion. His beliefs did not waver under pressure, and I appreciated that about him. 
I learned that sometimes, sorry, I mean a lot of times, his internal filter didn't work quite right. For example, when telling certain stories, he'd often forget that we were sitting in a restaurant full of people. We had to avoid a few of those restaurants for a while after. We could never get that filter fixed. These are just some of the things that made him so special. And I'm so proud and honored to say that he was my best friend. And I know he was the best friend to many. Tony was often the last one to leave our family parties at the house. He always liked to stick around and enjoy a few more beverages and just talk. I like to think that Tony found an escape from the stresses of his near daily police work when he was in our home. We would talk sometimes for hours. As time went on, Lynn would head home, my wife Jennifer would head up to bed, and it was just Tony and me talking. I will truly cherish those moments for the rest of my life. Over the past 18 years, our families have celebrated many important events together. We celebrated Brooks and Sean's beautiful wedding, trips to the Utica War Memorial to cheer Brent and Brad, when their respective high school hockey teams each made it to the New York State Final Four. We celebrated Bryce and Aaron, our daughters, as they won every imaginable cheerleading tournament for the Fairport Packers. We celebrated the arrival of their three beautiful granddaughters. We celebrated our son Trevor's graduation together. And just recently, our 11-year-old son, Brendan's birthday. Brendan is Lynn's godson, and Tony was his guy. Tony aptly gave Brendan the nickname Scooter, and only Tony was allowed to call him it. Brendan misses being called Scooter so badly already. And my daughter Erin misses her second dad terribly. Brooke, Brooks, Brad, Brent, and Bryce, we love each of you more than you will ever know. You are all, special part, all a special part of our family and always will be. We are just a phone call away, and you know those aren't, and you know those are not empty words, but rather a promise to you. Lynn, you were a rock for Jennifer and I during the scariest and darkest time of our lives. We will never be able to repay you enough for your friendship and support. In turn, we promise to be your rock during your darkest days ahead. I promise you will not walk this journey alone. We will always be here for you, and we will always answer your call. We love you always. In closing, over this past week, I've read and heard countless accounts of the positive impact Tony has on those around him both inside and outside of his police family. We've all heard and read about it, but I think it's important for Tony's family to see it firsthand here today. So I want to take a quick, quick moment, if you'll oblige, and ask any members of the RPD, active or retired, that have been directly impacted by Tony in a positive way over the past 29 years, to please stand for me. Please, please remain standing. I ask Lynn, Tony's parents, Frank and Rose, and the rest of the family to please turn and see those he's directly influenced. His positive impact and spirit 
will carry on in each and every one of his brothers and sisters standing here today. Now I ask anyone else in this arena that has been positively impacted by Tony in their lives to please stand. I assure all of you that Tony had no idea the magnitude of lives he has touched, including the many who couldn't be with us today, but are here in spirit. In spirit. What a beautiful tribute to a wonderful man. Thank you. God bless each and every one of you. Tony, rest in peace, my friend. I will miss you dearly. Now put your clothes back on. Good afternoon. For those who don't know me, my name is Dave Smith. I have the honor of being the chief of the Rochester Police Department. I'm going to talk about Tony in a little bit, but first, I would be remiss if on behalf of the entire Rochester Police Department, I didn't express my gratitude to this community who has stood by us through this terrible tragedy. Your prayers, your support, your compassion, have truly sustained us this past week in our time of need. In particular, I would like to thank Mayor Malik Evans for his steadfast support of this department since he became mayor and I took over just a few short months ago. Myself, the department will never forget what all of you in the community have done for us. I'd like to extend a special and heartfelt thank you to the many law enforcement officers who've come here to comfort us and to honor our fallen brother. To the troopers, the officers, and the deputies from so many agencies, thank you. Your presence here today says what no words ever could. Even now, as I stand before you, troopers, deputies, and police officers from every agency in Monroe County have volunteered and are guarding the city of Rochester in our absence so that we could be here today. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention all of the Rochester Police Department's civilian employees, all the dispatchers and telephone operators at 911. We know you too are with us every day, and as part of our law enforcement family, we know that you grieve with us today. To Lynn, Brooks, Brad, Brent, and Bryce, words cannot express our profound sorrow at your loss. We thank you for sharing Tony with us. And although we all know how much being a cop meant to him, we also know that his family was always his true priority. We also would like to express our deepest sympathy to Tony's entire family and all of his friends, neighbors, for this sudden loss. Perhaps one of the hardest things to deal with is the fact that Anthony was taken from us suddenly with no warning, and we had no chance to say goodbye. To the families and the loved ones of all police officers, this is a trying time for all of us. And I thank you, the families, for sharing your husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters. We are all grateful for your love and support as we perform our life's work. And although we may not speak about it as often as we should have, we all know the sacrifices our families make for us. But police work also has its rewards, many of which can never be known or measured. 
Officer Anthony Mazurkowitz touched numerous lives every day during the course of his 29 years in the Rochester Police Department. Some of those lives were certainly changed for the better. And some of those people certainly went on to help other people and change other lives. Only Tony and God truly know how much good he did on earth. But I am 100% certain that God had more work waiting for him when he called him home. I'm going to go off script here for a little bit and just talk. I mentioned before law enforcement. But what is law enforcement? What is it, this thing we do that I say is our life's work? On any given day, an officer, a deputy, a trooper could respond to a motor vehicle accident. They could respond to a medical call and be the first person there and have to render first aid. They could have to go to a house and help a parent whose child is just so on their nerves that they couldn't take it anymore and they called 911. They could have to mediate a dispute between a couple, spouses, mediate disputes between neighbors, help the mentally ill. Most often, we deal with basically good people who have made bad choices. But even if one day, by some miracle, there is no more poverty, even if someday there are enough mental health workers or no more mental illness. And if somehow all the weapons magically disappeared, there would still be work for law enforcement and the police. Matthew 13 tells us of the man who sowed good seed upon his field. But while he slept, the agents of evil spread the seeds of evil. And when the wheat grew, so too did the weeds. The man's servants wanted him to pull up the weeds, but the man told them no, for in pulling up the weeds, we might also pull up the good wheat. The man said that the weeds would be separated from the wheat upon the harvest. So too is it, is it with us, just as agents of evil spread seeds among that wheat field, so agents of evil spread seeds among us. Until the ultimate harvest, who is to protect the innocent from the murderer? Who is to protect the innocent from the rapist? Who is to protect the innocent from the child abuser? That is us. That is law enforcement. Doing precisely what Tony was doing when he was taken from us. And we will continue to do it even without him. My closing words are for the men and women of the Rochester Police Department. Thank you from the bottom of my heart what you do every day and every night. I know I don't get to see you as often as I would like, but your work is not lost upon me. There is no nobler a life than a life of service. So as we finish here and we lay our fallen brother to rest, we will all go back out we will all step across that line once again to protect this city and these people. We will do so perhaps with a sadness that was not there before, but with the same pride and commitment that makes us the Rochester Police Department. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Mazio. I'm with the Rochester Police Locust Club. <clears throat> and I worked for Tony. He told me that about 10 dozen times. There's not been enough time since we last gathered here in this arena with a sea of blue all around us to honor one of our own. But here we stand today once again, here to honor a true hero. A hero 
that would never admit that he was one. If you were to yell, hey, hero, into a crowd, he would be the last to turn around, even though he had every reason to be the first. I can hear him right now responding to that claim with a, sure, sure. Tony's deep devotion to his work was split into two very distinct paths. One path was as a union representative, a position in which he solidly served for over 20 years. As a member of our board, he was an active participant, a member who never shied away from any task or work that needed to be done. He spoke up when he had something to say and needed to be heard. Tony at times was brutally honest in his words. Tony's honesty was one of his best qualities because what you heard, what you got, was what Tony was. You could not question that. For Tony, you served on the board to take action, to get things done, and your responsibility on that board was to work. In fact, his mantra for being a rep was to work, take action, and most importantly, not to be just a sandwich thief. He was tireless. He worked so hard behind the scenes. It didn't matter where, in the kitchen, outside, anywhere. If you asked who was on our House Committee, you'd have to say his name first. But actually, he was not even a member of that committee. But he put more time in than anyone on that committee. He was a longtime member of our scholarship committee, a task that required a lot of work and tough, difficult decisions. However, <laughs> it wasn't difficult for him. He chose by one simple rule, those who had proved themselves worthy through their accomplishments. But I'll remember Tony most for his last work, a work that's still in progress as a member of our current contract team. Tony usually started each team session with a little commentary. Usually it was of whatever the current event of the day was or what was occurring in the world. And he'd start with, so. He'd then go on to tell him some issue or comments or something had been thrown out in the media, reciting the words verbatim and then ending with, sure, sure. <laughs> of all the contract teams that I've worked on, Tony was priceless. Just the other day, the rest of the team brought me a notebook. That was Tony's. I want to give it to Lynn and the family because Everything that's written in there is in his own words. But I want to share some of what he wrote. And these go back from our earliest meetings with the city. Tony, I'm writing things because everyone else is writing things. <laughs> I have no idea how we got on this topic. Ted is writing stuff. So is Matt. Dan isn't writing, but did say a few lawyer things. Paul's playing on his phone. I'm taking lots of notes. <laughs> Mike is telling some jokes, and now we're off topic again. She proves she can read. Comprehension is an issue. More bad jokes. Hey, lunch is here. And I'm helping Paul with lunch. That 
was Tony. He worked on a lot of language in the contract, but even his own notes, he did not take any credit for the efforts that he did. Our team has made a promise, and that is this contract is Tony's contract, and he will be with us until we complete that. Tony's other path in his work was as a committed tactical police officer. Being so committed gave Tony little patience for anyone who generalized or painted police officers with one brush. It angered him because he believed in what he did. He believed in the importance of what he did, and he believed that he could make a difference. Tony proved that, proved it, by going out on our streets at a point in time of unprecedented violence and danger. And while also at a time when a police officer in this city or in this state or across the country has an undisputable right to question in their own minds why should why they should be willing to jeopardize their life, lay down their life, in order to save someone, someone they do not even know, who may even have a callous, cold disregard for an individual just because they wear a uniform. Why? Why would Tony? Because he was a true hero. not for recognition. He did it for himself. He did it for his family, the family that he loved, that he worked so hard for, a family that he wanted a better life for, and for his police family. He wanted to make their life better as well. He did make us better because he raised the bar a little bit higher, a little higher for every one of us to follow. He challenged all of us to do better by bearing witness to how he served, how hard he worked, how he felt about his job, how he felt so strongly about those that unfairly attacked the job that he loved so much and he believed in so strongly. He had strong feelings, and sometimes Tony had even stronger words. Words that were not just directed at critics of the police, but also at times against his own, because Tony knew and was not afraid to say that the only way to silence the critics is to be the best that you can be. And for those that were not willing to try, he had very little tolerance for them. And for those who tried, he'd give them everything he had, including his life. On behalf of all of Tony's brothers and sisters, actives or retired of the Rochester Police Locust Club, we give our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to the emergency medicine and trauma teams that provided medical care for him in his last hours. Thank you. We thank all our brothers and sisters in law enforcement and the first responders who have come here today or have sent strong, caring words of support to honor Tony, support his family, and his police family as well. Tony would not ask for our support, but we know how appreciative in his heart he would be for his mom and dad, for Lynn, all of his beautiful children, 
and grandchildren he loves so dearly. God bless you, brother. We will, we will miss you, but never, never forget you. I can't believe we are here again. For the second time in the last eight years, we lost a member of the Rochester Police Department, both assigned to the tactical unit in a line of duty death. I am Captain Ray Deerkop, the commanding officer of RPD Special Operations Section. Tactical unit officer Anthony Maz Mazurkowitz was one of my officers, and he was my friend. As a tactical unit's commanding officer and as a former member of the unit, I am honored to speak about the brave men and women, past and present, whom have worn the rockers. The tactical unit is made up of the highest performing officers tasked with the most difficult and dangerous missions. Signified by more than the rocker sewn on a member's sleeve, the eights on its cars, or the gauntlet pin worn proudly on their uniform. TAC members bond through generations. When it gets bad, call the eights. Violence, eights. Murderers, eights. Riots, eights. A unit with a decorated history, rich with traditions. History and traditions that are proudly on display inside the unit's office at 261 Child Street. A virtual museum of pictures and plaques that tell its story. One full of triumph and tragedy. One picture in particular stands out more than the rest. A picture of Daryl Pearson, a stark reminder of the dangers they face on every tour of duty. Officer Pearson, also assigned to the tactical unit, was murdered in the line of duty on September 3rd, 2014. A unit so beloved by its members, there are only three reasons members leave. Retirement, promotion, or tragically, as we have seen, twice in the last eight years by line of duty death. Maz, a Rochester police officer for 29 years, would have celebrated his 20th anniversary as a member of the tactical unit. Maz could have retired from the job years ago or sought a safer haven and an administrative job within the department. Yet his passion and call of duty to protect the citizens of the city of Rochester compelled him to remain on the streets he so loved. On the night of his tragic death, Maz and partner officer Sino Sang were engaged in a surveillance seeking a murder suspect. The relentless dedication to duty to remove a dangerous suspect from the violent streets. As we are all aware, the streets of the city of Rochester have seen an unprecedented historic rise in senseless violence, shootings, and murders over the past several years. Tactical unit members are disciplined and brave professionals. Maz was just that. They make up the Rochester Police Department's honor guard, the very officers who are leading today's service for our fallen brother. Self-motivated, skilled street cops with a mission-first mentality. A team where it is always duty first before self. 
And there is no better example than in the tragic night of Thursday, July 21st, 2022. Every officer's nightmare, a radio broadcast, shots fired, two officers down. Officers Zerkowitz and Sino Sang were ambushed in a cowardly manner. The murder suspect, while hiding in the bushes, fired at the officers in an unprovoked attack. Officer Sang, while being shot three times, pulled Officer Mazurkowitz out of the active line of fire. Courageously, Officer Sang then returned fire. Officer Sang, your heroic actions likely prevented further injuries to officers and citizens who were at the scene. You, sir, are a hero. Fully aware that two of their own were seriously wounded, the unit remained disciplined and focused. Tactical officers Mike DePala, Tom Kirk, Dan Rizzo, Dominic Borelli, Tom Van Acker, and Rich Rodriguez loaded their wounded brothers in cars and sped to the hospital. Simultaneously, a team led by tactical officers Eric McGraw, Kyle Eisenhower, Alex Bermudez, and Herb McClellan apprehended the suspect who was located hiding in the attic of a vacant house several blocks away. The suspect was still in possession of the murder weapon. I had the honor of knowing Officer Mazurkowitz my entire 28-year career. The past two years serving as his commanding officer. The tactical unit produces leaders and for 29 years, Maz led. Not with stripes or bars or stars, but by his example. Officers of every rank looked up to him. I looked up to him. When I needed to get an unpopular message across to the troops, I went to Maz. He had a way with people because he was fair and treated everyone with respect. Maz was beloved by his co-workers, family, and friends. A true cop's cop. The tactical unit, elder statesman, patriarch, and guardian. Officer Maz was a man of quick wit, loyal and brave. A family man of honor and faith. He loved his family above all and spending time with his grandkids. To wife Lynn, Children Brooks, Bradley, Brent, and Bryce, I am heartbroken, and I'm so sorry for your loss. The Mazurkowitz family will always be part of our extended police family. May God bless you and all assembled here today. To my brother and sister officers, in a time in law enforcement, when it is easy to question the mission, do not listen to the naysayers. Stay the course. Complete your missions. Your communities are counting on you. The thin blue line is the only thing between criminal violence, chaos, and a civil society. It has been said that policing is a noble profession of selfless service. Maz did it for 29 years, and no one did it better. Take care of each other as Officer Maz took care of us. Officer Mazurkowicz, badge 557, car 8840. You leave a proud and endearing legacy. We got it from here. Thank you.
to screw this up. Strangers in the night. No? All right. How about this one? Ringling. Forget it. Forgive me, everybody, for the private jokes and references throughout this. Um, and hopefully those that know the meaning behind them will smile a little bit more today. Tony bought cotton out toilet paper because he loved his wife so much. <laughs> One day they were having a conversation, Tony and Lynn, and she said she preferred cotton out. So at three in the morning, we got out of work. Tony went to the store and bought two jumbo packs just for you, Lynn. <laughs> Pretty much everything he did in his life was for you. 28 years of marriage, right? 28 years. All the smiles and scowls that went on in those 28 years. And there was never a doubt who the center of his universe was. Never once did he let a dispute ever overtake his devotion to you. It was wonderful. One of the best. Knickknacks, tchotchkes, thingamajigs. We all got them. They litter our house. They collect the dust. Tony called them foamy fingers and cowboy hats. On trips, he told the kids, no foamy fingers and cowboy hats. And then immediately after, they would put things on the counter, completely contrary to what Tony wanted. And he... He would simply pay for them because it made you happy and he was happy. After being perpetually exhausted from raising four incredibly active children, you Brooks brought three beautiful little girls into his life. Three beautiful, active, energetic, beautiful girls into that old man's life. He'd come to work Tuesdays late with a smile and bags under his eyes. That's just the way it was. And he was happy. It was wonderful. Brad, as the days came closer to our fishing trip to your grandfather's, he would talk about what he would do with all the fish you caught. I had to remind him, if Brad catches fish, they're Brad's. I, you can't tell him anything. And then one day, well, more than one day, but he talked about all the experiments in the kitchen and all the fabulous dishes he came up with. And he let it slip one time and told me it was when you would experiment at the restaurant. And that was it. I had him. I knew where it came from. So every time he told me about an incredible recipe, he, you always got the credit, except for the pepperoni chicken. That was wonderful. You, my friend, never let him down. Never once. Like his siblings, Brent was an incredible athlete in high school. He talked about him a lot. A lot. Clippings all over his locker. He didn't have to even hear Tony talk about Brent. Just come on into the locker room. Brent's on his first enlistment in the Air Force. 
And if you didn't know that, you'd swear that Brent was the chief master sergeant of the Air Force just by listening to Tony. He'd tell you all about Brent, which took a very, very long time. And for eight hours a night, he'd divvy it up between all the kids. Eight hours a night, five nights a week. And I loved it, every second of it. Then there's Buck Wild. Who knows how many baseball games, baseball games you played, Bryce? But I'll tell you right now, he could tell anybody how well you played and what you did and every move you made in every game for all of those years. And I challenge anybody who knows Bryce or those that will meet Bryce to tell me that she is not 99% Tony. <laughs> right, Lynn? He tells stories about you going off to college all the time to the point that I thought I was moving you into college and the apartment. I could tell the stories. That's what happened every night. And after your white coat ceremony, he repeated it to everybody again every single night. It was wonderful. He had pictures of all of you in his locker, outside, inside, on the sides, in our car. No doubt that parents are proud of their children, but he was proud by 1% more. Tony was honest. He was brutally honest. He didn't sugarcoat the truth, but he wasn't cruel with the truth. He'd tell you that tab A goes into slot B, and he'd watch you do it. And if you didn't do it right, his next instruction would be, quit being stupid and do it right. And then when you did it right, he would nod and walk away. And you were proud of that nod. It was wonderful. Maz may have seemed as soft as 20 grit sandpaper, and Maz may have seemed gruff, true. And Maz may have seemed like somebody you didn't want to walk up to and meet. But Tony was always friendly. He was always ready to help anyone with anything. He was always concerned for everybody in his life. He was always the first one to look out for everybody's safety. Tony always put his family first, and he always put himself last. It was wonderful. Tony cherished his position at the Locust Club, always advocating for its members, making sure that we were protected. And during one of our social events, Tony was showing around his Aunt Martha around the building. I was in the kitchen cleaning up. He came into the kitchen with Aunt Martha. And, uh, oh man. Man, he got me again. He came in and said, and that right there is our dishwasher. And I looked around and I thought, what? That we don't have a dishwasher in he. I felt like a squirrel that didn't see the dog sneaking up on it. He leaned back with that ridiculous smile, rubbed his belly and said, it's pretty old, not much to look at. It barely works at all, but he gets the job done. One of our bosses, in a very heartfelt way, called us, called Tony, an emotional terrorist. And it made you smile. It was wonderful. Tony loved talking about family, immediate family, extended family. Loved talking about the folks up in Amsterdam. So one night he mentioned a name that was familiar to me through my mother. 
and we struggled and we came up with some blurry branches to our, uh, to our family tree. We laughed. He immediately put our van into a U-turn. We were working plain clothes. We didn't say another word. We instinctually knew what had to be done. Got back to our office, we trotted up the stairs. And as we got to the top of the stairs and down the hallway, we belted out a whole series of, hey Randy, Randy, hey Randy, calling out to one of our bosses, Sergeant Randy Potuck. That's what we did. We got in the office and the look on Randy's face went from annoyance and disgust immediately to primal fear when we told him that we just might be cousins. <laughs> it was wonderful. One of the best. One of our crowning moments, one of his crowning moments, Tony's, was when Sergeant Carl Berg, another one of our bosses, let loose of profanities at Tony to get out of his office, get out of here, things like that. Except Tony was still in the hallway, about five yards from the office. He was so proud that the shift hadn't even started yet, and he was already under Carl's skin. <laughs> Tony beamed about it for months. In fact, he loved it when I, uh, when I told the story about it. He would just sit there and smile. It was wonderful. Sergeant Coniglio had, us, Coniglio had us figured out through and through. We didn't bother messing with Kenny. No fun in that. Plus, we didn't want to ruin our open invitation to his private bar, so we left him alone. Tony had opportunities to go anywhere in the department. Just a handful of months ago, we were being coaxed to put in for a job that guaranteed Monday through Friday straight days. The idea, the idea of leaving you guys, of walking away from, from the tactical unit, disappeared as quickly as that first sentence ended in the effort to recruit us. He loved where he was and what he did. Every night, putting on that stinky black hoodie, his ball cap that you all are very familiar with. Going out to that minivan and getting in that disgusting smelly van, spending at least eight hours doing what he loved to do. He loved his songs. He loved singing all his songs around the office, especially the Christmas carols. It made us laugh all the time. One of our former lieutenants, Joe Graham, once said that he loved hearing all of us in the office laugh all night long, night after night. Tony was always the center of that laughter. There were a few of us that ended up working together for nearly two decades. We all transferred back in 2000 went to one assignment together, and then we moved on to tactical. His first two partners after that transfer in 2000, Bill Fennerty and then later Dennis Cole, moved on in their careers, has since retired. And then I jumped in with Tony. It was a natural succession. It was inevitable. And even though we've been friends for decades, we all had a little piece of Tony. Tony and I have been talking about retiring now in a couple years. We figured 30 years out there every night, and that was enough. I was assigned to the union on 21st, taking care of some things to do what Tony was motivated to do, and that's to ensure our members were taken care of. I didn't have to go in on the 21st, on that Thursday. But that night before on that Wednesday, Tony and I talked about it. Like so many other times, when this particular meeting would come up, I'd go into the union, sit through the meeting, do what had to be done, go home, 
and then come back into work that night. So we talked about it on Wednesday. And he said, don't bother. At that time on Wednesday, there was nothing special planned for Thursday. He was going to take a half a night anyway. So on Thursday, sitting on the couch, and I decided, you know, he's not going to spend very much time at work. I'm not going to bother driving in. Gas is expensive, you know. So what has happened before, Sino, who works in Genesee section, he was alone that night. So he came over to hang out with us, and he jumped in my seat. I'm so sorry, Sino. I'm sorry you have to carry this for the rest of your life. Nothing can change what you feel, but I hope you'll take a little solace in knowing that Tony liked you so very much. He thought the world of you. He respected you, and he trusted you. Never question yourself about what happened that night. You, my friend, did everything right. There are evil people in this world. Rochester has its fair share. There's a record number of murders last year, and we're on our way there right now. Three more mothers are grieving since Tony was taken from us. It's not about employment. We don't say, I was just doing my job. Getting violent people off the street of the streets of the city of Rochester, it's in our hearts. We love coming to work. Tony and I love coming to work knowing that we were out there looking not for the guy having a beer on the corner. We don't care about them. Not for the kids smoking weed on the corner. We don't care about them. We're going after the evil the real evil in this city, the real evil that plagues our, communi plagues our community. It's what we believe we're meant to do. It's what Maz faithfully did for 30 years. So, drawing from conversations Tony and I had for many, many nights, to the social media tough guys, to all the anti-police activists, and to the self-righteous politicians, we are never going to stop doing what we do. You can say and do whatever you want. We are the balance to that evil and we will continue to be. For the people that don't believe in what we do, you are irrelevant to the people. to the people that want to be safe from violence. We talk to victims every day, Tony, me, everybody. We talk to them. They don't ask for anybody else but us. Sure, there's gonna be one or two that hate us, that don't want us around. But I challenge anybody to go down Jefferson Avenue or Hudson Avenue and find the family that won't come out of their house. They keep their kids inside. Ask them who they want around. We know what the truth is. Who else is going to take away the violence? Who else is going to go after those people that are harming our citizens? You?
We don't care what anybody thinks about us. Tony sure didn't. And after all this is over, we will be out there doing what Maz, I, all of you, and every cop on this planet does. We're going to arrest the bad guy. Only the end of the world is the end of the world, and the sun will rise tomorrow. I will continue to wake up and take my first conscious breath of that day, and I will still say thank you. And then I will face my personal challenge, the challenge that Tony and I talked about, and it actually was the root of everything we did at home and at work. And I offer that challenge to everybody here, to everybody watching, to everybody that you can tell it to. Try. Every day, try. To smile a little bit more today than you did yesterday. 261. Be quiet. So I was a little noisy coming up the stairs. My name's Dennis Cole. I'm a retired Rochester police officer. Most importantly, retired tactical officer. And that's why I'm here. You've heard Captain Deer Cop, and this is a little bit off script because I got something I already prepared. But you heard Captain Deer Cop, and you heard my friend. Paul Romano. Well, there's a reason why we're all going to sound the same. That's because we were built, we were created, and we were perfected by the tactical unit. So they're all going to sound kind of the same. But I guess that's because we really need to hear it multiple times. But before I can actually get going with what I have to talk about today, I'm going to officially unretire for about 10, maybe 15 minutes. Thank God this is a little bit bigger than my grays. Even before I get going into this, I got up this morning and I did something that I knew I shouldn't have. I got up this morning and I just checked the media. Sadly, some of our brother and sister officers over in Indiana, they're going through the same thing here. Because last night another officer was lost. Now I know that we have some local politicians and I know that we have some state officials here. But I pray that perhaps maybe this reaches some of our federal ears. I pray that it does, because this has got to come to an end. It's got to come to an end. And it ain't going to get there by figuring out what the hell color tie you got on, or the easiest path of resistance to make sure that you can continue a four-year haul. This has got to come to an end. I think enough is enough.
Lynn, Brooks, Brad, Brett, Bryce. Frank Sr., Rose, Lisa, Frankie Jr., words can't take away this pain. But just know, we've always been right there with you, and we will always be with you as we go forward. I'd like to say a few thank yous. I'd like to thank ECD. For all of you who've known me over these years, my relationship with them was not always perfect. Got to be honest, got to be true to who we are. But I thank you all because you did a great job that night. I want to thank strong medical staff. You guys are awesome in more ways than I'm going to describe here today. And I want to thank everybody else that played a role during this difficult situation. I pray for the speedy recovery of Miss Tamiya Walker. I pray for her family. I pray for that community over there. Just know, you're a little bit safer now. You can go back outside and you can play again. The tactical unit, we're on our job. We got it. It's okay. I have a list of law enforcement officers. See, these things here I got to read because I'm, I already know that I've forgotten at least three people on this list. But it's not, on, it, it, it really, it's not intentional. But I have a list of law enforcement officers that I want to recognize. But later on, for the sake of saving a little bit of time, I will just refer to them as the list. I already apologize for missing some of you. And I'll apologize for maybe mispronouncing your name or not identifying you by your proper rank. But Officers McGraw, Merklinger, Shelnut, Saras, Eisenhower, Bermudez, Loriano, McClellan, Kirk, Van Auker, Borelli, Rizzo, Mikey D, you're always Mikey D. Sino, Sino Sang, and Officer Rodriguez. Also want to recognize Deputies Deal and Zawatsky. Investigators Benjamin and Korea, Sergeant Slowick and Bacchus, Lieutenant Perone, as well as Captain Umbrino. Now, I'm sure that there's more of you, but right now, you guys are my list. When I began to prepare this, something really hit me hard. Why are we here? Why are we here? Now, on the surface, that's a pretty simple question to answer. But that's not how we did things. That's not our way. We dug deeper. We looked at it closer. We dissected it. And hopefully, by the time I get to the end of this thing, you're going to be able to see this perhaps maybe the same way that I saw it. But before I get to that, here's the comical part. I got to address an issue that popped up. So bear with me for a second. Through Twitter, TV, radio, and social media, it's come to my attention that some folks got a question as to what the tactical unit really does. I think that Captain Deertop really hit it flush. Officer Romano got right back up here and he stomped on that wood too. Well, the nail is way buried in there, but make no mistake, I just unretired myself. So I'm about to get a couple of kicks in there too. We are the keepers in the night. We're the ones that keep everybody safe. We never say no. It doesn't make a difference if we have enough manpower to accomplish the mission. The mission will get accomplished. 
Oddly enough, in a world that's filled with just self-righteousness and somebody give me an extra award, we seek none of these things. We only hunt the appreciation of our peers and knowing that we did our job and we did our job right. That's it. Nothing extra. That's all. But that's a good question, though, to all of my little email warriors. That's a real good question. Because we were here eight years ago doing the exact same thing. Tell you what, you're really good on the computer. Why don't you fill us in as to how many arrests we made in that eight-year period? You're really good with statistics and data. How many lives did we save during that time? My friend right there, my brother, we helped to facilitate all of that. I'm not going to waste a lot more time on my uh, little email warriors. I just know that the city of Rochester is a hell of a lot safer when we're out there and we're doing our jobs. Oh, I forgot. We look pretty good, too, when we dress up. All right. Sorry, I, I jumped around here hard because we had to go in that direction. But if there's any confusion as to what the tactical unit has been doing since its inception since 1966, here is it in simple form. Bad guy goes out. Bad guy does bad thing. We go out. We find bad guy. We catch bad guy. Bad guy goes to jail. Citizens are safe. That's what the tactical unit does. That's what we did. That's what these guys all do. So a little bit ago, I said, why are we here? Right here doing this. Why are we here? Well, it's really simple. We're here because on July 21st, Maz did his job. Maz did his job. That is why we're here. And so some of this stuff here, I'm going to make sure that I'm covering all of this because this is the really important part. Because I don't think that everybody really understands how that question has been dissected, at least as far as I see it. But Maz did his job on July 21st. And to be totally honest with you, he's been doing his job since April 12th of 1993. And he's been doing it damn well, I might add. We live by this motto, this code. We're not cops. We're not police officers. We're professionals. We lived at a higher standard in every aspect of our lives. To be honest with you, Maz is probably the most professional cop that we have had here in Rochester, New York in quite some time. And I'm not even going to begin to think of what tomorrow looks like for Rochester because it's not fair to the men and the women of the Rochester Police Department to think that you can pick up and carry on what he was doing. It's not fair at all. My friend, No, my brother. He never said no to any detail or assignment. Captain Deercott made that clear a little while ago. No matter the task, no matter what type of person that we were dealing with, no matter the situation, Tony was always a professional. It didn't make a difference if you were Republican or Democrat. It didn't make a difference if you were black or if you were white or if you were Hispanic or if you were Asian. 
It certainly didn't make a difference of what status you had attained in life. Tony handled everything professionally. Nothing was ever personal. Nothing was ever personal. I want to make sure that it's clear. Everything was always professional. He would always do his job in a professional way. And if you needed some help, and God knows every last one of us that have been around him, we needed help getting the package done, I got you. What do you need me to do? I'll fill out the blotter. I'll do the info. I'll make the copies. He'd probably talk a little trash about it, but he'd still do it nonetheless. He was always there to help others. And he'd teach us how to become more professional. And as I was writing this, I, I thought like he would. He'd say, huh, kind of weird, because that's not how our society is living right now, helping others, giving of themselves. You're right, brother. That is weird. But I'll tell you what. At this point, I'm going to do what Maz would do. I think some folks have been waiting for it anyway. So I'm going to do what Maz would do. I'm going to go out and I'm going to help some others. How you can help us, well, here you go. For anybody who's asking how they can help us, I don't have a lot of time to repeat this one. So try to pay attention to it and stick with me. First and foremost, everyone here in this building is a person. Everyone in this building is a citizen of this country. And if you're a citizen in New York State, we're citizens first. There's been an awful lot of reports put out, an awful lot of opinions. There's been some executive orders made regarding our recent gun violence epidemic. And it seems that our elected officials, they want to actually protect us, the people, the citizens. But oddly, they don't know how. Well, here's my inner mass. I got two books here. This one right here, this is New York State Penal Law Book. There's a whole bunch of pages in here. There's a whole bunch of laws. It gets revised almost weekly. There's extra orders put into it. Geniuses really continue to come up with this. It's an imperfect book. This one right here is called the Holy Bible. Now I'm not here to take you to church. I'm here to prove a point. Now, it doesn't make a difference if this one was produced in 1972, 2002, or 2022. There's no revisions, brothers and sisters. There ain't. It's the closest thing to perfection that we got. So, Mr. and Mrs. Politician, if, go ahead. So, Mr. and Mrs. Politician, if you're still somewhat confused as to what you need to do to protect and help your citizens, to help your people, I'm channeling my inner mass. You can read either one of these. I really don't care. The answer is in both of them. But please at least read one of them, because I'm getting tired of coming here and doing this. Enough of all of that. 
Thanks for helping me channel yourself, buddy. But now let's get back to my brother Maz, because really, that's what it's all about. There was never a need for chief stars, captain's bars, sergeant stripes, or an investigator's shield. He was all of those things wrapped up into one <laughs> quick-witted, sharp-tongued, comical little package, although the package got a little bit bigger as the time went on. But he was all of that. I sat right beside this man, and, and I watched him do it countless other times as, as we would dig through dozens of reports to find the fine details that others had somehow missed. I watched him put together operational plans, assign all their officers tasks, sit back and watch it unfold like a proud dad. He didn't really like to be on the administrative side of things, but he could still do it. He could sit back, watch the board, listen to the radio, and just let it unfold just as he had planned. Now, he would interject if he felt that something was going wrong, and he would do that from time to time, uh, as only he could. But he did all of these things so very well. Maz was always a professional. He did his job. He did his job. Since 1993, Maz and I, we shared every aspect of our lives together. I told my wife, I told my father, I told my mother, my grandparents when they were alive, that uh, Maz and I, we were the two closest human beings on this entire planet. I knew every aspect of you guys' world. And I'm sure that you had no idea because that was between him and I. I watched him become a husband. I watched him become a dad. I watched how he attacked his personal life exactly the same way he did his professional one. He did his job. And he did it well. Like a true professional. A little later on in life, I lost my grandparents. And Tony, Lynn, and the kids... Y'all actually helped me to get through that part of my life. As Bradley so eloquently put it earlier, Tony finally reminded me to get together. And I did. And uh, I never did get a chance to really thank him for it. But I will always be forever grateful. Once again, my brother doing his job, helping out others. So finally, I actually got married. My lovely wife, Mary, is here with me. And, uh, and we started to have kids. And God knows, I had no idea what I was doing. But Tony had seemed to figure it out. So I began to listen to him. And I began to try to emulate him and become a professional husband and a professional dad. All of you probably think that that's an easy task, but I have four really unprofessional children, so that's a lot of work for me. But, uh, but I tried really hard. Now, I know my kids and my wife, they might not, might not necessarily think that I've been doing a good job, but I have been really reflecting on the conversations that Tony and I had had about me doing that job as a husband and a dad, so I'm going to get back to it 
a lot better. But the point of the story here is that was once again Tony doing his job. A few pages ago, because I only wrote four of these, I, I didn't want to keep us too long. And, but uh, at the beginning, I asked the question, why are we here? Well, by now, it should be pretty clear. I've dissected it. We've reached in there, and we, we pulled away all of, the, all of the trash. We just got right down to that one component. We're here because the man did his job. He did his job. Didn't question anything. He did his job. And that's why we're here. We're all here, and there's some form of, of joy that I actually have because of the job that he did, the job that Sang did, the job that the list that I described earlier did. I described the TAC unit. Captain Deercop described the TAC unit. Officer Romano described the TAC unit. There's one little caption, though, that I actually I meant to describe earlier, but I'm glad that I'm going to hit it right now. The TAC unit, when we are assigned a task, and we're not going out there picking up the person who stole a, a, a piece of candy from a store, we're, we're going out and we're tasked to find the worst and most horrific people that we can think of on this country. And we find them. We find them every time. Every single time we capture them. Mr. and Mrs. Politician, figure out how to clone us so we can capture all of the evil. That'll help. But we capture him every time. He did his job. On the night of July 21st of 2022, Maz and Sang were conducting a surveillance detail in plain clothes. Maz and I, we'd done this at least 150 times over our career. At least 150 times. I know his every move. I know exactly what he did when he left the office. I know exactly every turn that he made. I know that he drove down the street to figure out where the target location was. I know that he came back a little later to pick out some landmarks so he'd be able to identify it when it was nighttime. I know what my brother did. And for all of my other brothers and sisters out here in the audience, he did everything right. He didn't make any mistakes. There's nothing that he did wrong. There's nothing that we could have done to change what this evil that opened up and just brought into our world. There's nothing that we could have done differently. Not any of you. Don't question it. Don't ever question it. At approximately 21, 15 hours, this evil rocked our worlds. And we had to deal with the unthinkable. But you know what, though? He still did his damn job. He got on the radio. And yeah, my brother was hurting. But he got on the radio. And he directed the troops to come on in and help him off as sing. Officer Sang did his job. He dragged our brother over, tried to protect him. And then my brother and the list, we did exactly what TAC do. We catch him every single time. So as my brother was fighting for his life at the hospital, I find great comfort in knowing that he fought until 23, 23 hours. 
So that way his brothers and sisters in the list could do what they do. Capture him every single time. And it brings me somewhat of joy to know that we caught him once again at 2,200 hours, meaning that my brother lived longer than that man will ever see freedom. And you can feel free to clap about that because I'm damn happy. I'm just about done, and I really would be wrapping this up really, really quick, but on Saturday I had an opportunity to go to Mass with the family, and the bishop, he, he blessed us with his presence, and there was something that he, that he said in closing, and I found it to be fitting, and I can promise you that Mass does not want and never would have asked for any of this, but I found this to be fitting when I started to think about it, how the bishop described it. This is not a normal service. This is not a normal situation. You've had 10 people, 11 people come up here and talk about Tony. He's not a normal person. Adam, your, your son Henry was right. He is a superhero. He's a superhero. Because he deserves all of this. He deserves to be remembered forever. For all of my impact guys, I forgot, so I'll get it right now. Tony and I, we, uh, we operated in a world of laughter. That was our medicine. This job is a stressful one. God knows that. So we would just walk around the office and we would say stupid things or we'd come up with silly jokes in order to try to make y'all laugh. Take your mind off of the seriousness that we have to face. If that didn't work, well, we had this, this neat little way of, uh, of treating one of our most deserving citizens to a quality drink of water from time to time. And how we handled that, we handled that just like true professionals. We had a lot of fun. Those are the things that I'm going to hold on the most. I'm not going to worry too much about what I'm going to do tomorrow. We've been together for 29 years. If I just start reflecting on those years, that should last me the rest of my life. So in closing... I leave you with a question followed up by a scripture. We're here clearly because he did his job. So my question to each and every last one of you, regardless of your profession, and think of it more in terms of just your job, because I've just gotten on telling you he was a professional father, a professional husband. But my question to you all is, how well are you doing your job? Not in one aspect, but in every aspect. How well are you doing your job? Answer to yourselves, not to me. He never needed anybody's applause. He never did. That's my question to you. I close in the book of 2 Timothy, in the fourth chapter, verses 4 through 7. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions through the work of the evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith.
God bless you all. My name is Father Ed Palumbus, and I have the privilege of having my life been touched by Tony and Lynn and their family for many years when I served as their pastor in Fairport. As I listen to so many wonderful words of testimony today, what came to mind was a visit uh, that I once had in a cathedral in London, St. Paul's. And there the very famous architect of that cathedral is buried. And on his tombstone are the words, if you wish to see his memorial, look around you. If you wish to see Tony's testament to a life of faith and service and love and care, just look around you today. See yourselves as reflecting his commitment to serve and protect, to live a life of integrity, a life of service, a life of care, and a life in which he laughed and loved and rejoiced. We are here today to thank God for the gift of his life. We are here to thank God for the ways in which his life touched so many of ours, in which his life helped serve the broader community. And if we wish to keep, keep his memory alive in our hearts. Let it show in our actions the way we live and love and care for one another and for the community in which God has placed us. So let us pray. O oh, good and gracious God of holiness and power, accept our prayer on behalf of your servant, Tony. In his heart, he desired to do your will, to put his life at the service of others. And as his faith united him to all of your people on earth, so may your mercy join him to all the angels and saints in heaven. Through the death of your Son upon the cross and sacrificing for us, you have destroyed our death. Through his rest in the tomb, you made holy the graves of all who believe in you. And through his rising again, you have restored us all to eternal life. For you are God of the living and the dead. Accept our prayers, O Lord, for all those who have died. We die in the hope of rising again as we are joined to Christ. And since those who have died were true to your name upon the earth. 
Let them praise you in the joys of heaven. Merciful Lord, be with all those who serve and protect our community. May we always remember the work we do is an extension of your goodness and care. And as you know the anguish of those who, who are filled with sorrow and are attentive to the prayers of the humble, hear your people this day who cry out to you in need. Strengthen our hope in your lasting goodness and in the triumph of good over evil. And Lord, grant eternal rest to Tony. And may the perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. And may his soul and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. And may that peace of the Lord bless us, console us, and gently wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we make this prayer with confidence in your great love for us. Amen. On behalf of the Mizerkowitz family, the Rochester Police Department, and the Rochester Police Locust Club, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's service. This portion of the service is concluded. Please remain in your seats until the ushers guide you outside for the honor ceremony. Immediately after the honor ceremony, all first responders and their families are invited to a reception at the Rochester Riverside Convention Center. Thank you, and God bless, Tony.